Man, in light of Thanksgiving, I thank God I'm not in hell. Amen. Thank God I don't have to worry about going there. I don't have to look over my shoulder and wonder if I lost my salvation. Amen. And I'll tell you right now, uh, we're going to be looking at seven judgments on, uh, over the next couple of weeks on Wednesday nights. And this came up as a result of being in the book of Psalms and uh, looking at the judgments of God and how God is righteous and how He always does things right. Yeah. Um, and there, there, are, there are more than just seven throughout the book. God judges different instances, but these are the seven major ones. And the one I want to talk to you about tonight is God's judgment on sin at Calvary. If you can get this thing figured out, number one, it will make you a better witness for Jesus Christ. Number two, you won't doubt your salvation. And most people that do or that teach that you can lose it don't understand this judgment on sin. Uh, but look at Leviticus chapter number 11. Can I have some water, babe? Leviticus chapter number 11, and look if you would at verse number 44. You ever notice sometimes as a parent, you say something over and over to your kid, and they go, yeah, 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 I heard you. And you're like, no, you didn't, because if you heard me the first time, I wouldn't have had to say it the second time, uh, or the third or the fourth time. Thank you, sister. Amen. Uh, but you know, the Lord does that throughout the Bible. He does it for a reason. Uh, back to back sometimes. Look at Leviticus chapter number 11. And look at verse number 45, 44. For I am the Lord your God. This is God speaking to the nation of Israel as He gives them the law from the Old Testament. And while there are definite uh, differences between the Old and New Testament, let me tell you something about God. God has never changed. Right. Amen. The nature and character. We believe in rightly dividing the Bible. Amen. We believe that. Uh, but God and His character is, it, the big word in Bible school is, it is immutable. That means it doesn't change. And He's the same yesterday, today. You better thank God He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, or you might be in hell tomorrow. He doesn't break His word. Thank God for that. But part of that is a, a side of God that the world today and modern Christianity doesn't want to think about. And you learn about that here in Leviticus chapter number 11. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves and ye shall be holy. Why? For I am holy. Look if you would at verse 45. For I am the Lord that, brought, that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy. Why? For I am holy. When's the last time you heard a modern preacher talk about living a holy life as a believer? Let me, let me tell you why I'm bringing this up. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. Peter's giving some instruction, and you'll find this in the New Testament. You'll find where the author of a New Testament book will sometimes refer to something that God originally said to Israel, and they'll apply it spiritually to the church. Look, if you would, at 1 Peter chapter 1. In verse 15, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. One last place, and you can be seated. Genesis chapter number 18. Genesis chapter 18. You know what we're going to learn tonight? God's not filthy like we are. I don't, I don't say that out of a false piety. I say that because the more I get to know people and myself the more I recognize the God that wrote this book is not like me. That's right. He's different, and He's holy. And in Genesis chapter number 18, I want you to understand what's going on here. Abraham is speaking to God about God's judgment that is about to fall on Sodom and Gomorrah. Look, if you would, at Genesis chapter 18, and look at verse number 25. And he's, he's trying to work with the Lord and, and just get him to consider, what if there's a few people that are still righteous? In verse 25, he says, That be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Father, tonight I ask for your blessing on the word of God. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me. Lord, uh, I know this, Lord, uh, you've asked us to be holy, and Lord, you're a righteous God, you're a holy God, and you judge sin, and you hate sin. And Lord, I'm glad that I'm going to a place where there is no sin. 
Lord, I'm glad I'm going to a place where there are no hospitals, there are no jails, there are no detention centers. There's, Lord, uh, no sickness, no pain. Lord, there's no temptation. Lord, I can't wait to get to that place. Lord, I, I pray you'd help us to understand you. Lord, help us to get a glimpse of you, of your holiness tonight. Lord, help us to understand how your holiness intersects with your mercy at the cross. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be better preachers of the gospel, better students of the Bible. Lord, we love you, and we ask for your help now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated if you would. Let me say this. The judge of all the earth always does right. Whether modern man thinks he does right. I've heard Christians, recently Christians say, oh, I just don't know if, if that's really the way that, that, that God should do. If that's the way we should look at it. I say, wasn't well, it in the Bible? Well, yeah, but I just don't know if that's too harsh for people. Listen, God is always right. I'm not saying we always handle his judgment right, but he's always right. And, and, and when we look at the judgment of God, especially on sin, you better understand something as a child of God. You better thank God that when it comes to your sin, we're going to look at this, it was judged eternally at the cross of Calvary. But let me say this. Don't think you're going to pull a fast one on God. Whatsoever you sow is what you're going to reap. And there's many a Christian that sows the flesh and they reap corruption. God has always judged sin. It's not like the, the, today anymore, you talk about the judgment of God. It's almost like people go, well, that, I think that's an Old Testament God. He's not a schizophrenic God. He's the same one. And, and, and the, the modern Christian presents God more like, I don't know, Santa Claus. There's nothing he would ever say to do that would hurt. I mean, you know, you won't even watch all the modern Santa Claus movies. It's always like, you know, there's this kid that does something wrong, but really, he's just misunderstood. And he deserves a present just like everybody else. And everybody looks at God like, that's it. You know, basically, I'm misunderstood. It's the way I was raised. No, you're accountable for your own sin. The judge of all the earth always does right. Go look at Genesis chapter number 3. Let me show you this. From the beginning, there's been judgment on sin. Can I say this? The first time God judged sin is not in Genesis chapter 3. It's in Isaiah 14. And can I, can I just challenge you a little bit tonight? I thought about this on the way here. The greatest enemy of God has never drank a drop of liquor. He's never snorted cocaine. He's never committed fornication. He just tempts God's people to do it. You know what got him judged? Pride. God always judges sin. We tend to categorize, we, we, there's a little bit of, I call it Catholic hangover in us, in us today. Well, these are the big sins and these are the little sins and these are the sins that are, listen, sin is sin. And when Paul writes about sin in Romans 7, he says, sin, that it might appear sin. Nobody, uh, people say, you can't build a church that way. You're going to run people off. I understand, listen, listen, let me tell you something right now. I, I, there's, a, there's a thing that happens to every preacher when someone comes in. You know what you do? You pray as a pastor that they stick it out, they believe the book, they grow in the Lord, but they don't all do that. And let me tell you this, I'm not going to lower the standard and lower the preaching of the Word of God so we can just get more people to fill a building, to get more money, to get a bigger building. <laughs> that makes no sense, guys. That is the modern church today. I'm going to give you the Word of God, and my prayer is this, that over time, consi consistently getting the Word of God, and you getting in the Bible, and letting the Bible get into you, and you looking at what God says about sin, and letting God clean you from the inside out, will change your life. And you can look back five, ten years down the road and go, man, look at what God has done. Not me. Look at what God has done in my life. So I've yielded to His Word. God has always judged sin. Christian, don't. Be tricked into thinking he won't. He always does. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, you know the story really well. I won't read all of it. Uh, you know the, the, how this thing goes. It, 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 uh, in Genesis chapter 3, in verse number 11, God shows up. And I like this. I don't know if you ever thought about this. Is not God, here's another big word, is not God omniscient? Doesn't God know everything? Is there a question that God really needs answered? I mean, but he asks the questions anyways, doesn't he? Parents, again, I'm going I'm to do this with you parents. Don't you ask questions sometimes to your kids, and you know that they know that you know the answer. 
And you do it for a reason. You do it to get something out of that kid so they realize what they have or have not done. And here in Genesis chapter 3, you say, what happens? The Lord talks to Adam. Look what he says. Who told thee that thou wast naked? I mean, the Lord knows the answer, right? He asks him that, and he goes on to say, Hast thou eaten of the tree where have I commanded thee? Thou shouldest not eat. God watched the whole thing. And he's asking Adam for a reason. That's how God deals with sin in your life if you're saved. He'll say, hey, you should be looking at, should you be looking at that? He knows the answer. Should you be thinking about that? He knows the answer. Should you be going there in your mind? Should you be saying that? Should you be laughing at that? Should you be putting that in your life? Should you be hanging out with him? Should you be going there? The Lord knows the answer already. But he throws it out there. You see why? Because he's about to pronounce a judgment. Look, if you would, at verse 12. And I love this. The man said, the woman. Amen, guys. If it wasn't for the woman, everything would have been fine. The woman whom thou gavest me. Now, here's what's interesting. I believe this, and I preach this. The man is going to take the responsibility for this thing, and God puts it on the man. You see that from the New Testament. But let me show you something. Every single person in here gets judged. It isn't just the woman. It isn't just the man. It's not just the people. It's the serpent as well. They all get judged. The man's got to go to work, and he's got to make it by the sweat of his brow. Uh, the lady's going to basically feel like she's dying when she gives birth to a child, and the serpent goes from walking upright to slithering on its belly. Everybody gets judged. And at the end of this thing, they get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And paradise goes to the heart of the earth. And it's not taken up to heaven until Jesus Christ ascends. In Ephesians chapter 4, you read about that. You say, what happens? God judges sin from the beginning. Look at Matthew chapter number 7. I'm going to have you look at a lot of scripture tonight, and uh, this is midweek Bible study, and I might raise my voice and I might preach, but it's still Bible study, amen? So look at Matthew chapter number 7, Matthew chapter number 7, and uh, let me say this, every once in a while, it's good for the kids to see some snorting, some, some snotting, some sweaty preacher up there, just spitting and spewing out the word of God. You say, why? Uh, get, put a little bit of the fear of God in them. And let me say this as well. Here's what I learned about people today. You raise your voice, and I, I mean, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be rude or crude or anything, but I've learned this. I could tell my dog, I'm going to put a bullet in your head. You're just, yes, I am. I'm going to bury you in the backyard. They're never going to find you. Yes, that's right. He'll wiggle his tail, and you go, oh, that's terrible. Right. You know what else I can do? I love you. And that dog will just so, oh. You say, why? Because sometimes people listen more to how you say something than what you're saying. And I know sometimes I can get loud, a little bit, but just listen to what I'm saying. I do that sometimes to get you to think a little bit. You know what Wednesday night is? It's like smelling salt night. You're out in the world. They're convincing you their way is right. And, and just in a couple of days, you say, why? Your flesh already gravitates towards that. In just a couple of moments, the world's rocking you to sleep. You come in on Wednesday night, go, whoa, what's that? It's the Bible. <laughs> It's good for you. Matthew chapter 7, look if you would at Matthew 7, and you say, what is this? This is a final judgment on sin. And it says here in verse 23, Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. That is not a religion, that's a person. And if a person dies without Jesus Christ, they go to hell because they don't know a man. They don't know a person that is their Savior. And he says, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What is my point in showing you that? From the beginning all the way to the end, God judges sin. But there's a place in time where a special judgment took place that will never happen again. And if you get in on what happened at that judgment, you're sealed unto the day of redemption. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 26. Look at Matthew 26. I am so thankful for my Savior. I'm thankful that He did something that sometimes I'm not willing to do in return. You know, He does in verse 39. The Bible says He went a little farther and fell on His face. Do you, do you know what the Lord wants from you tonight, Christian? You say, oh, He wants me to, to give everything up and sell everything and go to the mission field. Maybe, but I'm going to tell you this. This is, not, this is how God works. He doesn't take someone that just got saved. 99% of the time and go, okay, sell everything, move to the mission field. Why? It would break you like a twig. 
You know what he does? He does stuff gradually, so he says, go a little bit further. You know what he does it when he's facing God's judgment, his father's judgment on sin? He goes a little bit further. And look what it says here in verse 39. And he fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. You don't have to turn there, but in Mark 14, 36, he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. In Luke twenty two forty nine, 49, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. John chapter 18, verse 11, Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword in the sheet. The cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? There's a specific cup that he speaks of, and that cup is not just a cup of death. There are three things connected with that cup. If you're taking notes tonight, three things. Number one, death. Matthew 20, 23. He tells the disciples, you shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. That's a cup of death. But look at Revelation chapter 16. Revelation 16, we're going to move quickly. Revelation chapter 16, end of your Bible. Revelation 16, look at verse number 19. That cup is connected with three things. It's connected with death. It is connected with the wrath of God. And let me say this again. God is not an old senile Santa Claus that doesn't know what's going on. That's the way the world presents, the man upstairs. He's not the man upstairs. He's a holy and a righteous God. And you ought to stand up, stand up for him every once in a while. Listen, every once in a while someone will say, I'm not going to say it, but they'll say my Lord's name in vain. And I'll say, oh, you know him. <laughs> hey, so, so just this last week at, my, at work, they said, they said Jesus Christ's name in a, in a blasphemous way. I said, let me tell you something. I said, he didn't cause this mess, but if you want to pray, we can pray right now. Said, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay, all right. But look at Revelation 16. Look at verse number 19. And the great city was divided into three parts. I'm at the end of the tribulation. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon, that's mystery Babylon, not physical Babylon, came in remembrance before God. God keeps score. Amen. <laughs> And to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Do you understand that it's, it's like this? Basically, you get to have that cup poured out at Calvary, or you've got a taste of that cup yourself someday. I take it at Calvary. Uh, look, if you would, at, at Jeremiah chapter 49. Jeremiah 40. I love, I have fallen in love with Jeremiah. Uh, this last time through my Bible. You say, why? Because, man, there's so much there's so much correlation with a Bible-believing preacher today and Jeremiah's ministry back then. The, all the preachers around are going, no, 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 everything's okay. What are you talking about? With their beautiful permed hair and their skinny jeans and their T-shirt with the glass pulpit. And they're saying to everybody, it's okay, there's no problems, it's fine. Hey, it, it is not like that. The church ends in apostasy. And if you're going to end up with anything at the judgment seat of Christ, it's because you don't go along with the church. You go against, I don't mean your local church, I mean against the church at large and the direction in which it's going. Jeremiah 49, look at verse 12. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, they whose uh, judgment was not to drink of the cup have assuredly drunken. And art thou he that shall altogether go unpunished, Thou shalt not go unpunished, but thou shalt surely drink of it. Listen, that, that cup is connected with death, with the wrath of God, and with judgment. Anybody, any takers on that? Anybody want that? Uh, I'll tell you what, I've been thirsty, but I've never said, man, I really wish I could have a cup of God's wrath. Amen? <laughs> you say, what is that? That's a cup that fills and fills and fills, and that cup is poured out at a specific place in time. I want you to remember that when Jesus Christ shows up in his earthly ministry, John the Baptist, and let me just say this for those that may not be as familiar with this, he's not called the Baptist because he's the first Baptist pastor in a church in Jerusalem. All right? Uh, we've been through that before. All right? We believe in right and divine the word of God. Uh, the law and the prophets were until John. You know what he's preaching when he's preaching? The king's coming. The king's coming. Listen, I'm not preaching the king's coming. I'm preaching he came and died for your sins. All right? But when Jesus shows up, John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away some of the sins of the world. No, it's not what he says. 
that taketh away the sin of the world. I want you to understand that Jesus Christ was that lamb on whose wrath God's judgment fell. I want you to go to Exodus chapter number 12. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. If I can accomplish anything for you tonight, it will be that tomorrow when you give thanks, it's not just for the car and the house. And, the ki and listen, these are all fine things thank God for, but that it's, Lord, thank you for not pouring your wrath out on me. Lord, thank you for saving my soul. Lord, thank you for giving me a hope in eternity. Look at Exodus chapter 12. And I want you to look at a couple of things here. There's some great, I was talking with Brother uh, Caleb about this before church. We were uh, working on some stuff around the house. And I say, we were working around the house. He was doing all the actual stuff. And I'm just going, yes, sir, whatever you say, boss. Anybody ever seen me with tools in my hand? I don't know what I'm doing. He says, you got a sledgehammer? I said, oh, yeah, there's some in there. And then he's looking, looking at Miss Jasmine. He goes, where's that sledgehammer? I said, I don't know if I have a sledgehammer. <laughs> he goes, where are your tools? Somewhere in there. You say, that's how you know I don't use them a whole lot. Amen. But uh, look at Exodus chapter 12. We were talking about this, and it's a great picture of Jesus Christ. Yes. Look at Exodus 12, and look at verse 2. This month shall be under you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Do you understand that wasn't the first month? This is, a, this is like close to April. Right. It wasn't the first month. Yet God's saying, we're going to do over. Reset button. And you know what that shows you? Your life does not begin until Jesus Christ. Amen. You get a new life. And I want you to notice in verse 3, he says, Speaking to all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month shall they take to them every man a lamb. There, listen, everyone, there is going to be a judgment. There is going to be a sacrifice for sins that is required by God as God's judgment on sin. Guys, when God kicked out Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, the first thing he does is he clothes them with the skins of an animal. An innocent animal had to die. Blood was shed to cover man, to cover his nakedness. And here in the Passover, as God brings out his people from, from, from Egypt and brings them into their promised land, he says, listen, let every man take a lamb. But look at verse 4. If the household be too little for the lamb. You say, what is that? It's not just about there being a sacrifice. There's only one that's going to do. Yes. Look, if you would, at verse number 6. Or verse number 5, rather. Your lamb. You say, what is that? You have to make it personal. <laughs> There's a sacrifice. There's only one that's going to work with God. And you need to accept it yourself. I want you to notice here in verse number 6. It says, you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly... You know what we are? You know what a church is? It is a called out assembly. You know what we do tonight? You know what this is? This is rapture drill is what this is. You know, you say why? Because someday every Christian, even the ones that don't care to be there on Wednesday night, don't care, make excuses for Sunday while they're not there. And listen, I'm not throwing stones at you. I pray you're here every time the doors are open. And if you're here tonight, praise God, I'm glad you're here. But let's be honest with ourselves. People do what they want to do. And when someone says, I couldn't come because of this, oftentimes what that means is it wasn't important enough to me. But regardless of that, you're going when he calls you, amen? Rapture drill. You know what this is? That's exactly that. You know what this assembly is? It's a reminder of something. We're gathering and we're centering around the Lamb. Look, if you would, at verse number 6, they say that God tells them in verse number 6, you shall kill it in the evening. For sake of time, I won't have you turn there, but you could look at Mark. If you want to write this in, you're taking notes. Mark 15, 42 talks about Jesus Christ and the time of his death. Now it approaches exactly that, the evening. In verse number 7, I want you to notice something. They shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house. If you can imagine someone doing the side posts. Boy, what is that a picture of? <laughs> You say, what is that? That is a place where God's wrath and God's mercy intersect. The cross. Notice in verse 10, you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. You know what he said about the work he was called to do? He finished the work. And that which remaineth of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. You know what he says while he's on the cross? I thirst. As a man suffering in hell. You say, what is that? That's a picture of Jesus Christ suffering. You say, why? Because sin has to be 
judged. I'm going to give you three or four things I want you to consider tonight. You say, well, man, that was just the introduction. Amen. (laughs) Number one, let me tell you something. You're going to have all day tomorrow to eat turkey and all the rest of it, all right? This will help you get ready for it. Number one, I want you to see the substitution for sin's blame. Look at Leviticus chapter 16. The substitution for sin's blame. I would like to preach a message about goats because I've had some experiences with them in the last couple of years. And the idea that goats will eat anything is so very true. That stupid goat, I watched that thing this morning. I'm doing the chores and I, I'm, I'm walking by and he's chewing. You say, what's he chewing on? A chain, a collar. And everyone in my family saying, did he eat it? No, he didn't do that. But he's just chewing on that thing. You say, why? Goats will eat anything. You get people in a church that aren't saved and you don't preach salvation, they'll eat slop all day long. Man, I could go on and on about goats. But I'll tell you what, they're filthy creatures, man. They're cute, but they're filthy. And uh, you say, what is, what is Jesus Christ made into? He's made into a goat for us. You say, he's the Lamb of God. And you understand that the sheep will be separated from the goats. Matthew 25, the judgment of the nations and, and, and all that. And throughout the Bible, uh, a goat is a picture of something that looks like a sheep, sometimes acts like a sheep, but it's not. It's not in the right place. It's lost. You say, what did Jesus Christ do? He became the substitution for sin's blame. Look at Leviticus 16. Look at verse number 20. You know, there's things that my my office, they probably get tired of it. Uh, They'll say something. I say, guess where that comes from? Now they're conditioned. I say, guess where that comes from? Bible. It's the Bible. Yeah, it's the Bible. (laughs) You know, someone said, talk is cheap. Talk of lifts tended to penury. Uh, okay, is it, where did that come from? Bible, all right? You know, uh, uh, money talks, baby, money talks. Money answereth all things, Ecclesiastes. Uh, the term scapegoat, you say, that guy was made the scapegoat for that guy. Bible, Bible. Uh, people say, go back to the Bible. No, we need to catch up to it. <laughs> look at Leviticus 16, look at verse 20. When he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him, look at this, all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their... If you can't get any more complete than that, man. He's saying all of the transgressions in all their iniquities, in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. You say, what is that? That's a picture of Jesus Christ being made sin for us and the substitution where I should have paid, where I should have been judged because I said, Lord, by faith I'll accept you as my Savior. Do you know what he does? He takes Jesus Christ as the substitution for my sins. He's my scapegoat. You know what the Bible says about Jesus Christ? When he suffers, he suffers without the gate. That's what it says in Hebrews. You know what they do with this goat? They get him outside of the city. He's not fit to be around anybody else. It's not fit to keep that sin in the midst of that city. So you know what they do with that sin? They send it away. You know what happened when you got saved? That sin was taken from your soul and it was put on Jesus Christ. He became your substitute. But can I say this? Someone still was judged. Sometimes we forget. It's almost like, hallelujah. There's this, there's this, I call it hyper grace, where everything's about grace. Grace this and grace that. Here's what I've learned about people that are always talking about grace. They have a little bit of it. Just a little, and that's about it. They exercise very little of that grace. Because if you don't agree with them on their hyper grace position, they'll cut you off. But let me say this, I am thankful for the grace of God. But understand with the grace of God, what that means is God's riches at Christ's expense. Somebody was still judged, and I'm thankful it was Jesus Christ. Thankful that he did that for me. Let me say it like this. If it wasn't for him doing that, that would have to fall on you. The substitution for sin's blame The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. You know that verse? We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let let me me say this, Christian, and I, I, I got it. It's on my heart. It's on my mind lately. I don't know why, but God just keeps bringing it back. When you get too high and lofty, and you start looking at yourself, look how much Bible I know. I'm not like them. I don't do what they do. You better stop right there. 
Because if it wasn't for God's mercy and God's grace, you'd be in hell right now. Listen, I think sometimes, I think the, the thing that causes me to weep more tears than anything else is thinking about the things that my heart has desired and craved and wanted and by the grace of God and by His mercy, He has kept me from. And not because of any stupid thing, because I'm, I'm the elect or anything like that. And forgive me, I'm sorry, I get tired of people saying foolish things that are not biblical. Listen, you are not receiving the grace of God because you're one of the elect, all right? You're receiving the grace of God because you elected him, and therefore, you are becoming one of the elect. Does that make sense? Some of you are with me, some of you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. That's all right. Let me put it to you like this way, guys. If it wasn't for Jesus Christ, God's wrath would fall on you. Why? Because he's holy. This idea, I'm going to keep bringing you back to this, this idea that God doesn't judge sin, and that's an Old Testament thing. That is not true. God is righteous. God is holy. You know what God does? He hates sin. You know, people all the time, it's almost like they want to air condition hell. They want to, they want to make heaven hell and hell heaven. They want to basically turn the thing upside down and say, well, I just don't see why it's such a big deal. Well, you know, if you were God, heaven would be a, a, an awful place. <laughs> you say, why? Because it would be like here. <laughs> If God allowed sin into his holy habitation, it would defile his nature and everything that's connected with him. So man wants to know him and man wants to reach heaven. And so Jesus Christ says, lay it on me, Lord. That's God putting our sins on Jesus Christ. I read about this story during the 17th century when Oliver Cromwell was the protector of England, he had sentenced a soldier to be shot for his crimes. And at midnight, when that bell was to ring, that would be the sign that it's time to execute that man. Midnight came and the bell never rang. Everybody wondered what happened. See, what took place? That man's love of his life, his wife, had jumped up there and grabbed a hold of that clapper, that bell. And every time, you see what's going on? She's getting the stuffing beat out of her. That thing's still going, but no one can hear it. And everybody looks around and wonders what's going on, and eventually they find this woman up there, and they bring her before Lord Cromwell, and he says, do you understand what you've done? And she shows him weeping. She shows him her hands, and they're bloodied. And because that man knew something from the Bible, he looks at her, and he looks at that man that deserved to die, and he says, because of your lover, you shall live because of her sacrifice for you. You say, what is that? Listen, someone still paid for it. Jesus Christ still paid for it. His hands were bloodied. His face was, his visage was marred so that we could not behold him. There was no beauty found in him. You say, what is that? He's my substitution. You see a substitution for sin's blame at that judgment at Calvary. When Jesus Christ speaks about not drinking of that cup, he's speaking of God's wrath being poured out on sin. And he becomes a substitute. Can I say this? Your religion can't do that. And when I talk to someone that thinks that they're going to try to keep their own salvation, I'm convinced they don't understand this judgment of God at Calvary. Because the very reason that he did that was the very reason that that woman jumped up in that bell. It was either that or he would be shot. Jesus Christ, because of his mercy, looks at us. And let me say it one more time. Before you get high and lofty, remember that pride and jealousy and envy and, 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 and uh, self-righteousness and the things that are under the surface and jealousy and, and, and gossip and slander, the things that aren't smoking and drinking and chewing... <laughs> And, you know, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't chew, I don't, go, I don't run within the dew. That's the old saying. Listen, I'm thankful if you don't do those things. But let me say this. It's the stuff below the surface that also put him on the cross. Right. And when God looked at that, he said, I've got to judge that. But he judged it back there. And you better thank God that he did. Amen. Let me say this. You see the substitution for sin's blame. You see imputation for sin's payment. John chapter 3, go there with me real quickly. John chapter 3, we got to hurry. John chapter 3, you might be familiar with the verse. John chapter 3, and it says this in verse 14. As you turn there, Noah Webster says this about imputation. It's the act of imputing or charging. 
It is an attribution, generally in an ill sense. So what does that mean? It is looking for the guilty party and imputing their trespass unto them. The thing is, you've got an innocent lamb that has never done anything wrong. You've got a clean lamb. Guys, I'm sorry. We don't even understand. We cannot fathom the cleanliness and the holiness of a man that never sinned. We, 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 we just we can't grasp that. Sometimes we go, well, what's going to happen in eternity? And are we going to populate outer space? And what about this? And what about that? And all that's cool stuff. But can I say this? Get back to something that God has presented and try to figure that out. Try to figure out. How do I understand a man that never looked at a woman to lust after in his heart? How do I understand a man that never lies? He never says something just for his own advantage. He never manipulates. Let's be honest tonight, Christian. There's a manipulative spirit sometimes in God's people that will say things and do things and, and tweet things and Facebook things just to get people to see things their way. Jesus never did that. What am I saying? You've got a man that never sent an innocent lamb. And you know what happens? He becomes filthy. You know what Jesus says there in John 3, 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent? First time the serpent's mentioned in the Bible, he's subtle. And he tempts man. And over there, you don't have to turn there, won't, for sake of time, won't do it, but in Numbers chapter 21, do you understand what happened? The people were bit by fiery serpents. You know what God's solution to that is? Now, do you tell me if this... Tell me, guys, honestly, if this sounds like something that a man would do logically. Would a man say, okay, a bunch of snakes bit people, I got it. We're going to put a snake on a, serpent, uh, on, on a pole, and everybody that looks at that is going to be made whole. Man doesn't think that way. Man looks at it and goes, we've got to do something different than that. Why would we take the very thing that condemned us and, and put it up so everybody can look at it? You say, what is it? It's a picture of Jesus Christ. The Bible says of Jesus Christ, God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that we might be made the righteousness of God yes. in him. Amen. For anyone that's still dabbling with the, the idea that, you know, you accept Jesus, but then you've got to, uh, and let me be very careful about how I split this up. You should live a holy life to represent your Savior. You should live a whole life because God saved you unto good works. But let me split off this way. And for the brethren that think that because I've accepted Jesus and now I live a holy life and I, I maintain my salvation because you can't do that. You couldn't do it if you tried. You say, why? Because at some point you're going to break God's law. I, 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 get, I get fed up to hear with Christians that act like I'm the one that's kept the law. They don't have their salvation. You know, the queers and this and that. They don't have their salvation. But, I mean, someone asked me, do you think someone could get saved and, and live that lifestyle? Some of you are going to really not like me for saying this. I think a saved person could do anything a lost person could do. You say, why? Well, now, I'm not advocating it. I just spent the last 30 minutes saying God's holy and you shouldn't mess around with sin. But there's a part of you that's not saved yet. And when you get into this line of thinking that, you know what, um, the reason I'm saved is because I'm living a holy life, that's garbage. You're saved because God did not impute your sins to your account. He imputed them to Jesus Christ, and I love this. I explained this to a guy named Mark at his door, knocked on his door with uh, Isabel the other day, and we're talking to this guy, and he, he talks about, I said, well, are you saved? And he goes, well, yeah, I go to church, and I go to this church, I've been going there this long. He said, okay, good. You know, and in my mind, I'm thinking it's like, you know, asking someone how old they are, and they go, I'm Chinese. Right. You know, and so he's, he's going on about his thing, and I'm like, okay. I said, but, but was there ever a place in time where you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? And I asked the thing about three or four different ways. I talked to someone just the other day, this week, and I, and I was asking this person, are you saved? Well, yeah, and they went through the story about how God saved their life. Wonderful testimony. I said, that's great. But let me ask it to you like this. If I'm dying right now, and I said, what must I do to be saved? What do you give me? The holiness crowd can't touch it because they can't wrap their mind around the fact that imputation is why you're saved. This is a Bible doctrine. This is why, guys, the church today is just drifting out. You say, why? They're not taught doctrine. Listen, the Word of God is given for doctrine. And, and let me go a step further. You might have a laundry list of what you think a pastor is supposed to be here for. And I guarantee you, I don't check all the boxes for you, and that's just fine. I, I can live with that. It's sad, but I can. You guys can just laugh. That's funny, all right? 
But let me tell you, you know what the Bible says about pastors? They're supposed to feed the flock of God and be given to prayer. Right. Acts chapter 6. You read that thing in Acts chapter 6. You read it in Acts chapter 20. You read it in 1 Peter. You say, what does he say over and over? Feed the flock, feed the flock, feed the flock. You know what most pastors are doing? They're going, okay, if I say this, and if I can just manipulate this thing this way, and I can please this crowd, and I can do this, I can get more people to come, and I don't offend them, then they come, and they bring their money, and we can build a bigger building. And you say, what's happening? No one's learning any Bible. And listen, tonight, my, my goal is not to point out how all the churches are all doing it wrong. My point is simply saying, I want you to have doctrine, not just so you can go, we learned about imputation. Let me give you the definition of imputation. I want you to learn it so you understand that you're saved because of what Christ did at Calvary. Look, if you would, at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I think it's important for you to read this. The Bible describes Jesus Christ as spotless. They say, I find no fault in him. That's what Pilate says. Never a man spake like this man. That's what the scribes say. He is blameless. He's the Lamb of God. He is holy. He's undefiled. He's separate from sinners, the author of Hebrews says. You want to split a church? Try to figure out who wrote Hebrews. Amen. <laughs> you know, I don't know, man. I guess Paul. I don't know. Uh, you know, some people, I think some people are, I'm convinced some people figure their ministry is to figure out all the stuff that God didn't make black and white in the Bible. You know, hey, listen, why don't you stay a little bit of time, just a little while, the stuff that he did tell you to do. Amen. All right, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, are you in him or are you not? Amen. You know, I love this idea that you can lose your salvation. It's almost like you crucify Jesus Christ every time you get saved again. It doesn't work. If you are in Christ, you are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, let me just say this about that verse. You take that and isolate that verse. You take it out of context, and you can make that thing preach it. If you haven't cleaned up your entire life, and it's all not all new, you're not saved. That is not what the verse says. As a matter of fact, the man that was, I would say, one of the greatest Christians that I've ever known of in the Bible, writes half of the New Testament. He says, the things that I would not, those things I do. And the, things I would not, and the things that I would, those things I do not. Wherefore, he says, what, what wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body? It's the body that's the problem. Now, here's what I'm getting at. If you're in Christ, that is a spiritual uh, a term about your position in him. And you know what that means? If you are in Christ, the judgment that was to fall on sin for eternity has already fallen on Jesus Christ, and you've been made righteous. Man, thank God for that. See, what is that? Imputation. Look at verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and have given us a ministry of reconciliation. You may not know a whole lot. You may not know a whole lot of Bible. You know what, though? You don't have to. You know, you could be, you could be just like that blind man that got healed in the book of John. And you know what that blind man said? They start drilling into him, and they're asking about, you know, blood-sucking vampires on Jupiter, and in the millennium, will we still have this going on, and in the tribulation, and they're asking him all kinds of questions. He goes, look, 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 I don't know. All I know is I was blind, and now I can see. Amen. Listen, if you're saved tonight, boy, you've got that much, amen? amen? And look what it says in verse 19, to wit, that God was in Christ. You know what that means? If you're in Christ, you're one with God. That's a blessing. Reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Boy, that's good. That's good. Look at verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. In him. Look at Romans chapter 4. Remember, it's midweek Bible study. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Isn't it amazing how the flesh works? You look at about five passages of Scripture, you go, oh, is he done yet? <laughs> you say, why? That's just your flesh. I'm with you. Yeah, I think sometimes people forget, pastors were once in the pew as well. And I remember sometimes on a Wednesday night, I've worked, I'm tired, and I have, and I'm with you. And, uh, and I'm going, man, is he almost done yet? I've got to get home. We've got to get the stuffing going, the sweet, and the sweet potato casserole, and the green bean casserole. Amen. <laughs> and if you're Puerto Rican, the arroz con gandules, right? And the pasteles, right? And by the way, hallelujah, I've got pasteles to take home with me tonight. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. <laughs> but let me tell you something. Listen, you need this, and I'm going to show you. You say, why? Because when you get into a conversation with someone, you're trying to explain salvation. If you can get this... 
Salvation makes a lot more sense. See, the reason that you're saved and you continue to be saved is because you're in Christ. And the wrath of God, the judgment of God fell on Jesus Christ. It was our sins were imputed unto Him. And His righteousness was imputed unto us. Look at Romans chapter 4. Romans 4, and look at verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man. Let me say this. Americans, modern American Christians, when they talk about their blessings, hashtag blessed, hashtag this, hashtag, you know what they're usually talking about? The house, the car, the this, the that. I got to raise at work. I'm not saying those are bad things to praise God for, but you know what this guy talks about? You want to see a blessed man? The man that's blessed is a man. Look at verse number uh, 6. Unto whom, God, uh, excuse me, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You know what he says there? You get to be that man because you live a good life. No, because you have believed on him that justifieth the ungodly. God's judgment fell on Calvary. Jesus Christ repeats the words of the psalmist from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What happened at that moment in time? He became sin. He became sin. And uh, let me go a step further. When you trusted him, you know what happens? All the righteousness of the life of Jesus Christ becomes yours. All your sin becomes his. You go, that's not fair. That's right, it's not fair. It's called mercy. But let me say this. In that, justice is still served. God's judgment falls on Jesus Christ. There's an eternal judgment for sin's payment. Look at Hebrews chapter number 10. We're almost done. You guys know preachers lie a lot. Hebrews chapter number 10. That's that nervous laugh you get. Ah. It's almost like when I started my wife's and their husbands. Ah. Or husbands, love your wives. Oh. <laughs> Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10. Look at verse number 7. Then I said, I, lo, a lo, I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written to me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not. Neither hast pleasure therein which are offered by the law. But I want you to look at something in verse 10. By the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ until you mess up. You better thank God it's once for all. Now let me say this, guys. There's a difference between eternal sanctification, which is what he's talking about, and daily sanctification in your walk with Jesus Christ. Where the hyper-grace folks fall off the bandwagon and where they go away from the Bible is they go, look, it's all done. You don't have to worry about abstaining from anything because you're righteous already. Listen, you're righteous in your soul, but your flesh, you've got to fight that thing, you've got to suppress that thing, you've got to deny that thing. That's what Jesus Christ says. You take up your cross, you deny yourself. But here's what I want you to look at. I want you to understand. There's this eternal judgment for sin fell on Jesus Christ and it was once and for all. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but in our Constitution, which is not the Bible, I don't put it on the same footing as the Bible, but there's a clause in there about double jeopardy. Talking about how a person cannot be tried for the same crime once that they've already been judged for. Do you understand that because you're in Christ, you cannot go to hell because sin has already been judged? You say, why? Imputation. On him almighty vengeance fell, which would have sunk a world to hell. He bore it for a chosen race, and thus becomes our hiding place. Look at Romans chapter 8, and we'll wrap this up. Romans chapter number 8. The next time someone takes you to Hebrews or someplace in Matthew and tries to get you lost after you've been saved, you need to ask them, what does it mean to be imputed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ? I think I want to make, I've made it clear, I'm not advocating sin. I'm not advocating you that you don't walk a holy life. You ought to be, you ought to live a holy life. You ought to abhor those things which are filthy. When stuff comes up on your TV or on your computer or on your phone that shouldn't be there, you ought to get rid of it. 
And if you can't handle it, get rid of the phone. Yeah, I said get rid of the phone. If you couldn't handle it, I'd get rid of it. Right. I, I'll tell you right now, giving some people a phone is like giving them a gun. Mm-hmm. Amen. <laughs> uh, well, what I am saying is this, though. When you do mess up, that's, a, that's a, a responsibility of a child of God for a second kind of judgment we'll talk about later called self-judgment, where you confess your sins to the Lord and get things right so that the flesh doesn't have victory and you can walk with Jesus Christ. But that's different than your position in Christ. Your sins have been imputed to Him and His righteousness has been imputed to you. You talk about a great business deal for us. Romans chapter number 8. Romans 8, look if you would at verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, not that it was sinful flesh, but in the likeness of it, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. You know what you can't do in the flesh? You cannot condemn sin. He did. You better get in Him or you don't make it. When you ask somebody if they're saved and they take about 20 minutes to answer the question and at the end of it you don't know that they've ever trusted Christ as their Savior, you need to ask them, are you sure? Do you understand what Jesus Christ did on the cross? Now listen, I'm not saying with a lost person you break down imputation and you try to explain all that, but here's what you can do. Let me me help you out with this. You see this? This is the life of Adrian Dominguez. And boy, it's got spots and and coffee stains. And if you ever look at my notes in my Bible, my Bible's got coffee stains and blood stains and all kinds of nasty stuff in it. And you look at this, and it's it's blue, and it's green, and it's yellow, and it's got coffee stains, and and it's dirty, and it fell on the truck floor, and your foot stepped on it, your footprint's on it. And you say, what is it? It's a mess. And when God sees this, He sees a sinful life. Here's the life of Jesus Christ. Never sinned one time. And when God sees it, what does He see? A sinless man. And I'll ask a lost person, you see that? That's sinlessness right there. That's a clean thing. But do you know what happened when I got saved? My life is hid in Christ with God. And when He looks at my soul, He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You say, why? Because His judgment fell there at the cross of Calvary. Look at Romans 8 and look at the last two verses in that chapter. Romans chapter 8, verse 38. I am persuaded, oh, that's good, that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come. Again, someone who doesn't quite get a hold of eternal security, I'm not sure. This is almost like the, let me cover all the bases for you. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you want to know what that height or depth is talking about, look at Job 11, verse 8, and Job 22, verse 12. talks about the dimensions of the universe. You know what that means? You know what David says? If I ascend to the heights of the clouds, lo, thou art there. If I descend to the sides of the pit, the depth, lo, thou art there. You know what what Paul is saying? Doesn't matter. Whatever happens in this life, you cannot be separated from Jesus Christ. You say, why? Because it says there in verse number 39, which is, look at this phrase, in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's judgment on sin. Boy, I'll tell you what. You better thank God He judged sin at Calvary. And you got in on it. But I I want to challenge you tonight. Tomorrow when you're giving thanks for all the things you have, and I'm thankful for my wife, I'm thankful for my kids, I'm thankful for this church, thankful for my church family, I love you. Thankful for a lot, thankful for my job, thankful for transportation, thankful for clothes on my back, thankful for food. But man, none of that would matter, and none of it would mean anything. And, and I wouldn't have the, the wife that I have, I wouldn't have the life that I have, I wouldn't have the kids that I have, I wouldn't have the church that I have, I wouldn't have any of it if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. You say, where does it start? It starts with the fact that God's judgment fell on my sin on Jesus Christ instead of me. You go to Thanksgiving tomorrow, thank Him for that. And when you're talking, when you think about the people in your life that you know, Christian, let me say it like this, that coworker, that family member, that friend, that person that you say, I don't want to say anything new, I don't want to offend them, I don't want to rock their boat, I don't want to make them not like me anymore, you'd be better off telling them the truth and letting them know the way out than them going to hell and looking at you and saying, you never told me. Let's all stand.